Well, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm grateful to the organizers for the invitation, Phil Sloan and his group. Um, I'd much rather be on this side of the equation than the other side that Phil now sits on, because I just came from Chicago, uh, where we organized a very large conference. And the typical kinds of worries that an organizer has is, are there enough cookies for the coffee break? What about that toilet that's overflowed downstairs? Um, those are the things that I don't have to worry about. I have to worry about your objections, perhaps, to what I'm going to say. Uh, but they will not, I think, be as messy as an overflowing toilet. I, too, am going to talk about um, the origin of human beings, particularly a trait that Darwin thought virtually uh, definitive of human beings, namely moral capacity. Now, unfortunately, moral uh, judgment doesn't fossilize well, except uh, perhaps among members of the intelligent design group. And I'm going to try to make two arguments. One, a historical argument, a rather improbable argument, and another, a philosophical argument, I think probably equally improbable to several of the participants here. The historical argument is going to be to the effect uh, that Darwin reconstructed nature in the origin of species with a moral spine, which is to say that he utilized certain tools that were in the repertoire of 19th century uh, biological theorists that um, helped him to, to do that, namely a teleological causality, and that the result of this reconstruction is that he understood nature to have an endpoint, a goal, namely man as a moral creature. Now, as I say, that's, I think, an improbable uh, hypothesis for many in this audience, but I hope to convince you at least there's something to it. Uh, the other uh, thesis that I'm going to argue for is a philosophical thesis, and it's namely that Darwin's theory of moral evolution is a perfectly acceptable uh, philosophical theory, that it, it sufficiently answers the question, uh, where do our morals come from? Uh, and I think there are probably philosophers in the audience who will find that a hard cookie to swallow. Now, in the increasingly secular uh, atmosphere of the 19th century, intellectuals grew rather weary of the idea that nature had any moral authority at all. In an earlier age, uh, one might have looked upon the dispositions of nature as having divine sanction, and thus one could uh, more confidently have referred to natural law as grounding moral judgment. Uh, certain behaviors, for example, might have been against nature or unnatural acts and therefore morally forbidden. But after the advent of Darwinian evolutionary theory in the mid-19th century, a theory that apparently rejected a moral structure to the cosmos, uh, nature then began to look like the enemy of ethical uh, judgment and moral inclination. Uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, Darwin's great champion, uh, declared in a lecture that he gave just before his death that one had to fight against the cosmic process since nature was completely indifferent to human welfare and substitute for it an ethical process, the end of which, and here quoting Huxley, is not the survival of those who happen to be the fittest, but of those who are ethically the best. Uh, Huxley, in his uh, lecture, was aiming his barbs at Herbert Spencer, but they struck deeply also into the heart of Dar uh, Darwinian uh, moral theory. Uh, Huxley was uh, taken aside by some of his friends, and um, they tried to show him the inconsistency of his view and what's characteristic about that lecture. So wonderful is one in its published form, what Huxley says in the text he takes back in the footnotes. In the mid-20th century, uh, Nazi biology appears to offer the cautionary example of not heeding Huxley's warning. Uh, the story is encapsulated in the title of uh, a book written by uh, Richard Weichart, uh, From Darwin to Hitler. Uh, Weichart is a member of the Discovery Institute, a intelligent design think tank. Uh, his book of 2004, of course, is simply entitled From Darwin to Hitler, and that's the trajectory that he maps out. Uh, he's making a small industry of this. He's just um, published another book with the subtitle the, the Nazi Pursuit of Evolutionary Progress. So that might appear to um, be the result of trying to ground human moral capacity in our natural uh, biological uh, features. Even those on the evolutionary side have interpreted Darwin's theory as promulgating the view that, that human beings are utterly selfish by nature. 
Um, many of you here know Michael Gieselin and will recall uh, Michael's uh, rather classic remark that in the Darwinian world, all you have to do is scratch an altruist and you'll watch a hypocrite bleed. Given the confluence of opinion about the implications of Darwinian theory for human moral character, I think it may come of it something of a surprise that these implications were certainly not endorsed by Darwin himself. Quite the contrary, Darwin believed that his theory, when applied to man, removed, as he said in The Descent of Man, the reproach, and here quoting him, the reproach of laying the foundation of the most noble part of our nature in the base principle of selfishness. Darwin believed that his theory could provide an explanation for authentic or pure altruism for the kind of behavior which indeed expressed the most noble part of our nature, and I happen to think he was right. A few days after Darwin hit upon, everyone has, will be overloaded with images of Darwin. Fortunately, there, are only, there is a finite number, uh, and this is one that you will have seen quite frequently. A few days after Darwin first hit upon the idea of natural selection in September of 1838, he opened up his N notebook and started to construct a theory of human moral behavior. Now, he did so, I think, because of a plan that he had in the development of his theory. He would show that the transmutation of species had a purposive trajectory, a decided goal, namely man as a moral creature. Now, as I mentioned, I don't think this is a idea that will perhaps go down too easily with you, but I think there's a, a limited amount of evidence that I can provide for you here uh, that might loosen your already uh, firm convictions. You'll recall the final peroration of the origin of species, which uh, Ken Miller quoted last night. I want to start with that last paragraph, but with the sentence that just precedes the one that, that Ken uh, quoted. It's where Darwin is trying to justify the suffering and death that natural selection exacts for the progressive development of life. He writes, oh, you've seen those figures before. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we're capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. And there's grandeur in this view of life and so on. Of course, the most exalted object, and object is here used in that rather more obscure sense of the most exalted purpose that we're capable of conceiving, is the production of the highest animals. And of course, the highest animal is man himself, human beings. This trajectory, that is the production of the most exalted object or purpose, and Darwin, Darwin's teleological construction of it, I think, are revealed in his reflections on the purpose of, in this case, sexual generation. Um, one of the problems that Darwin faced almost immediately, a problem actually inherited from his grandfather, was the origin of sexual generation as opposed to uh, asexual modes of generation, what we call clonal generation. A month after he began formulating his moral conception, he jotted in his e-notebook this passage, my theory gives great final cause. I don't wish to say only cause, but one great final cause of sexes. For otherwise, there would be as many species as individuals. Uh, he seems to have thought that uh, if, if uh, reproduction were clonal, um, that each offspring would be, as it were, an independent species. So that's what he has in mind. If all species, that is, every individual was its own species, there would not be social animals, hence not social instincts, which, as I hope to show, is probably the foundation of all that is most beautiful in the moral sentiments of the animated beings. If man is one great object, which is to say one great purpose, for which the world was brought into present state, and if my theory be true, then the formation of sex is rigidly necessary. Now, this is a perfectly teleological explanation of the origin of sexual generation. That is to say, um, there must be sexual generation in order that there be, in the future, social animals, and there must be social animals in order that there be, in the future, moral creatures, namely us. Hence, the teleological explanation for sexual generation is the future production of moral beings. Darwin, in um, just to recall for you the, the tra trajectory of Darwin's development, 
1859, publication of The Origin of Species. He begins that in 1856, works on it till he gets that fateful letter from Alpha Russell Wallace, compresses what he had produced up to that point, adds some chapters, and that's the publication. Earlier on in 18, well, in the er from about 1837 through 1840, Darwin is um, taking notes, working out problems. He has the vision. Uh, he initially tries different devices in order to explain uh, the transmutation of species, mostly of a Lamarckian character. He keeps all those devices. He, Darwin was believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics from the beginning of his career uh, to the end. Um, in September, uh, late September, September 28th, he reads Malthus, and as he said, he read Malthus for uh, amusement. He had a very low bar for amusement. And this gave him, as he said, a theory by which to work, which was roughly natural selection or the seeds for that idea that became natural selection. In 1842, he pens a, long, a, a modestly long essay, about 38 manuscript pages, that outlines uh, his ideas up to that point. And roughly, it's the very basis for the book that will become uh, The Origin of Species. In 1844, he expands the essay to about 250 manuscript pages. But one, uh, Darwin's origin might be looked upon as a kind of archaeological deposit. You can look at the surface, as you find it in the origin itself, and move down to its uh, predecessors of different passages in his notebooks and early essays. So that, that wonderful peroration at the end of the origin has its complement in the 1844 essay, where he talks about the most exalted end which we're capable of conceiving, namely the creation of the higher animals. In the 1842 essay, the highest good which we're we can conceive, the creation of the higher animals has directly come. And in his 1838 notebook, man is the one great object for which the world was brought into its present uh, condition. So that you can I see, I think, that I hope you can see, uh, that at the basis for Darwin's initial conception of his theory is a notion of a teleological process in which man is the consequence. One of the striking um, phrases that recurs in The Origin of Species is this. Um, well, this, is, this comes in the penultimate chapter. And as natural selection works solely by and for the good of each being, all corporeal and mental endowments will tend to progress towards perfection. Uh, Darwin believed in the progress of nature. I mean, there have been many arguments to try to maintain that Darwin was a neo-Darwinian. In the neo-Darwinian world, we perhaps dispense with that notion of progress. But Darwin certainly had not dispensed with it. It is endemic to his whole theory. Um, so that natural selection is going to produce that continued progress to perfection in our mental and corporeal uh, uh, traits. And it works solely by and for the good of each being. Now, that's a phrase that gets repeated um, frequently in the origin. But as we know from our perspective, natural selection does not work for the good of each being. Natural selection destroys most beings. It eliminates most beings. But I think Darwin's moral perception of the beneficent act uh, action of now natural selection was so strong that it overrode what we think of as the natural uh, consequence of his view. If I had time, what I would have shown you is a um, passage from Darwin's 1842 essay and 1844 essay when he's trying to determine uh, the character of natural selection. And he says, let us imagine an all-powerful being. So he's, he's explaining to himself what natural selection is all about. Let us imagine an all-powerful being that is selecting animals uh, for their own good as opposed to man who selects animals for his own good so that natural selection has that altruistic character. It is selecting organisms for the traits that will benefit them. Uh, that imaginary being, that mind at work in nature, also appears in uh, Darwin's Origin of Species. If you um, recall those passages uh, in um, the, the fourth chapter when he's explaining what natural selection is all about, 
Natural selection is that power that can penetrate to the very fabric of beings and select those minute uh, changes that would be beneficial to the being, not to human beings, not to man who might be an artificial selector, um, not for his utility, but for the good of the being which natural selection tends. And it shows that there is a far truer workmanship. Darwin's cadences in those chapters uh, have that kind of biblical ring. But I think what has to be emphasized is Darwin's conception of the operations of natural selection is, that, is not that of a mechanical process. It's, it's not a mechanism. It is mind at work in nature. If you survey just Darwin's linguistic usage in The Origin of Species, you'll find that the word mechanism or mechanical, in any of its forms, mechanism, machinery, and mechanical, appears only five times in the whole origin of species, whereas the term purpose uh, or object in the sense of purpose appears something like 65 times. Well, that's just a kind of clue that Darwin's conception of the operations of nature is not that of a machine operating inexorably, but there is discernment within the operations of natural selection. No, no phrase comes more trippingly to our lips than the phrase, the mechanism of natural selection. But I assure you, it never came to Darwin's lips. So he has conceived natural selection as if it were a mind making these choices. Now, Darwin wants to maintain as a good naturalist, a good scientist, he has taken his cue from William Ewell that we have to explain nature only through natural law. But the natural law operative, and natural selection is regarded by Darwin as one of those natural laws, we have to regard that as uh, a designed law. And Darwin was perfectly explicit about this. When Asa Gray wrote him in 1861, uh, about the consequences of his theory, Darwin said he objected to the notion of the direct impositions of the deity acting in nature on each specific kind of species creating it. But he thought that creation occurred through natural law. And the way he phrases it is designed laws are the operative uh, instrument of the creation of the species in nature. Uh, so that Darwin, from the, while he is constructing this theory, is already assuming that the laws governing nature, and this is a phrase actually that comes out of the manuscript that he was working on when he got Wallace's letter. He says, by nature, I mean the laws designed by God. The argument then, the historical argument, is that um, Darwin constructed his theory under that assumption that there were designed laws and these laws had a teleological purpose, the end point of which was man as a moral creature. Well, I'm sure that all of, I, I take it even right now, silence will indicate consent to that proposition. <laughs> In working out the um, Darwin's theory, he ran into many different kinds of problems. I'm just going to focus on one of the problems he thought he had to solve. And that was the problem that arose in considering the social insects. The social insects um, have a peculiar structure, as you know. Um, they have traits. The workers and the soldiers have traits that um, are distinctive of the different castes within social insect uh, colonies. But natural selection doesn't seem to be able to explain them because natural selection works on an organism to give it an advantage to reach reproductive age so it can pass those traits on. But the social insects, the workers and bees, and uh, the workers and soldiers, um, are neuters. They don't have offspring. So how to explain it? Uh, Darwin was flummoxed by that. For a long time, he thought, as somebody just quoted, that this was a, uh, a, a problem that was fatal to his whole theory. Now, we know that he solved the problem when he was constructing the origin of species itself. It was in the throes of the composition of that chapter on instinct that it came to him that natural selection works on the whole hive or the whole nest to give it an advantage over other nests that by chance don't have cooperative individuals, don't have sympathetic individuals, don't have 
individuals that are working for the good of the whole group. This uh, became, for Darwin, the solution to the problem of human morality. Um, Darwin recognized what are the typical objections to the spread of human, uh, to any kind of, uh, as it were, even natural selection, uh, consideration of human morality. That is, the traits that he found distinctive of human moral capacity are that they are altruistic traits. They do something for the recipient, but they cost the, uh, the actor, the executor of that, some they have some cost, and therefore natural selection would not seem to be able to produce them. But if you think that our ancestors lived in small tribal groups, these proto-humans lived in small tribal groups, then one could apply the same model the, of the social insects, that natural selection worked on the small group in order to select out those that had individuals who were more faithful, uh, who were cooperative, who were sympathetic, and who acted for the common good. And that, that th they, those groups would have the advantage. They would grow, split off, form further groups, and so on, so that the source, the ultimate source for Darwin, uh, was this kind of community selection. That would produce, um, ultimately, uh, moral capacity in the human lineage. Darwin also believed that along with that natural selection process, that biological selection process, which was selecting groups for greater numbers of altruists and those which were more effective within the group, there was a social evolution. So that one had to learn, for example, who was a member of the group. That was something that was not completely intuitive. Immediate, there are certain biological mechanisms, perhaps, that allow one to recognize one's kin, namely whom you grow up with is the easiest one. But what about that tribe across the river? Uh, Darwin thought that social evolution would allow individuals to perceive that the differences among different groups were quite superficial and that the tribe across the river was just the same as us. And once that recognition takes place, then the instinct of altruistic uh, concern can be exercised for them as well. And Darwin thought that the circle was growing. In the latter part of the 19th century, uh, as everyone knows, there, and Peter Bowler has uh, illustrated, I think, quite handsomely, that uh, there was an eclipse of Darwinism. Darwinism was going to be replaced by real science, namely laboratory genetics. Um, so it was only in the 30s and 40s, as you know, the synthesis was constructed. One of the things left out of the synthesis, there are several things that uh, people look back and say that they should have thought of X, Y, and Z, but certainly it's a concern for morality, which Darwin, again, thought distinctive of human beings. When the topic was taken up again by people like uh, Richard Dawkins and, and Michael Geislin, they simply assumed that it was going to be natural selection working on individuals that produced those traits that superficially looked like um, altruistic traits in a rather pure sense, but actually they are hidden uh, structures that allow one to uh, aggrandize one's own welfare as opposed to the recipient. Now I think Darwin's original theory with a bit of conceptual massage is, is really the most persuasive around. Moreover, the theory meets our intuitions of what a moral theory really needs to be, namely a conception that makes morality not something adventitious or accidental, not something that arises because of a hope of reward, either now or in the great by and by. Rather, it makes human beings authentically moral, deeply moral. Their morality is bred in the bone. Now, in um, the waning moments that I have, I'm just going to suggest to you uh, the ways in which Darwin's theory, aside from its conceptual clarity and the way in which this kind of conceptual argument, even a historical argument, might be mildly persuasive. As many of you will know, there is a great deal of activity going on among psychologists, um, economic behaviorists, uh, evolutionary psychologists. That name has a not a very sweet smell among um, many biologists. But there are efforts to demonstrate the um, the reality of pure altruistic behavior. And there are all sorts of little experiments that are done. Many of you will be familiar uh, 
moving rather rapidly, uh, were the trolley problems. Now, I'm just going to indicate what those problems are. So we'll, we'll have a, a, a bit of a survey here. Here's, here's the scenario. There's a runaway trolley. It's careening down the tracks. There are some workers on the tracks. If nothing is done, those five workers are going to be smashed. They're going to be killed. There is a, the trolley is going to go uh, under a trussle. There is a very large man, frequently depicted as a very rotund man, looking over the tracks, and Frank is standing next to him. Now, if Frank pushes that rather rotund man off and he falls on the tracks, he'll stop the trolley and save the five people. Is it morally permissible for Frank to heave the fat man off the trolley and, I mean, off the uh, bridge and onto the tracks and save the five people? How many of you think it is morally permissible? Just raise your hands. Well, we've got one person. A different scenario. Mary, who is a switch woman, she uh, is an engineer. The trolley is, has lost its brakes, careening down the tracks. If nothing is done, five men are going to be killed. She has a switch, and she sees the runaway trolley. She pulls the switch and diverts the trolley off to the side track. Now, there happens to be one person, she sees him, who is working on that track, and he's going to be killed as a result of that. Is it morally permissible for Mary to pull the switch? How many of you think it is morally permissible? Well, uh, certainly the majority, and I think if you were not bashful about this and not too terribly confused about the scenario, uh, more of you would say that indeed that is morally permissible. Surveys have been done, um, one by, famously by Mark Hauser, who has investigated thousands of people concerning these problems, and finds out that roughly 89%, so in one um, kind of study with 5,000 people involved, 89% think that Mary's action is morally permissible, while only 11% think that Frank's uh, uh, action is morally permissible. If you ask people, why the difference? It's the equation comes out exactly the same. Five lives saved, one life lost. Why is one permissible and not the other? Most people cannot explain why that's the case. It's certainly not a utilitarian calculus that leads to that, because a utilitarian calculus would lead you to say that they're both the same. So what's the source? Well, what one can, I think, argue is that there's deeply embedded in us principles of moral judgment, um, not unlike Chomsky's model of the of a universal grammar, we may have a universal moral grammar in which puts great constraint on the principles that we think acceptable. Most people judge this to be morally permissible and not the other. We have an explanation of that if indeed it is, as it were, bred in the bone. Now, there are many other kinds of empirical experiments that lead to the same kind of conclusion. If I had world enough in time and you had patience, I would argue about the normative character of this, because most philosophers will say, well, you know, maybe this does give an explanation of our behavior, but we still have to ask Huxley's question. If I have the impulse, you come up to me and say, you know, what a lousy lecture. I didn't understand a word you said. I might have the impulse either to belt you or be nice and shake your hand and try to be, uh, assuage your, your, your anger and objections. So I have to make a decision. What ought I to do? And that seems to be a reflective kind of decision that one has to make. Um, so Huxley says, you know, one's biology really can't solve that. Uh, as I say, Huxley took it all back in the footnotes. But we do act on these principles that are not cognitively uh, um, available to us. And I think it could be shown, and you'll have to take my word for it, that one can give a perfectly um, normative justification for Darwin's theory without committing anything like the so-called naturalistic fallacy. I think viewed from this perspective, uh, Darwin's theory does have a certain grandeur, and it is a wonderful theory. Thank you very much.
that is that good? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks. A lot. I think I'm really sympathetic um, with your what I take to be your main goal here of trying to find an evolutionary explanation of something like moral sentiment or moral feeling. Yeah. But I'm hoping, um, and with the sort of the ontological example you're giving here at the end, I'm hoping that maybe you've invited this that. Uh, I can ask you a couple of questions about how you're connecting history, uh, teleology, and morality. Um, relying, I guess, on, on Kant for the first question and Aristotle for the second. So, uh, <laughs> okay. And then we'll be done, right? Um, so, or so I first, might be done, yeah. <laughs> the first question, right, is that um, the move that you're making, and I take it when you said that this is a historical argument uh, with 19th century, century vocabulary, it seems to me to owe a lot to Kant's uh, work in the second uh, part of the critique of judgment, where he's talking about teleological judgment. Um, but of course, there Kant says that uh, when we make, although it might be the case that we make teleological judgments about living things, that really the purpose there is is a principle that we're employing, right? It's a phenomenal principle, not a noumenal principle. It's a heuristic in a yeah, certain sense. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm wondering why you would see Darwin not making a similar move, saying, yeah, we we talk in terms of purposes and objects, not because we believe that they're real, but because this ends up being the best way of providing an explanation better than a mechanistic explanation. So that's part one of the question from Kant. Part two, I'm gonna actually steal from Aristotle. Um, uh, so, what, but let's grant that for a second, right? And say, okay, so we're saying that uh, nature has a certain purpose. Why do we connect that purpose to morality, right? Certainly Kant does. But Aristotle will look at, at final causes and, and, and think it's absurd to think that the good of the human being is the best kind of good because human beings are imperfect and, and die and, and stars don't. So right, so it's the good of the states, you know, astronomical goods that are what we're all striving towards. So I'm wondering where in Darwin you would locate those two uh, moves: the move to connect purposes uh, to the world and not to our explanations, and the move to connect purposes to morality and not. Something well, else. first of all, Darwin disclaimed any philosophical so uh, sophistication. But it would be wrong, I think, to take him at his word, at least in this instance, because I think he constructed his theory, and he, especially the theory of morality, with a fair amount of, as it were, native intelligence about these things. There are two interesting historical connections with Kant. He, first of all, in The Descent of Man, he quotes Kant, but we know he cribbed that from somebody else. It has to do with duty. Um, but he gets Kant actually um, uh, circuitously uh, through reading of William Yule. So Will, uh, William Yule is a great uh, philosopher, historian of the early part of the 19th century. Uh, Darwin knew him quite well, and he read, reads his three-volume history of the inductive sciences right after he comes back from the Beagle. And in those chapters, what, what in the third volume, what, he do, what Yule does is sign on to Kant's proposition that uh, one can, um, one should forbid any kind of teleolo I mean, excuse me, any kind of theological construction of nature. Theology is one thing, science is another. What scientists do, they mm -hmm. have to have absolute natural laws in order to give an account of different phenomena. He would have agreed with, with Kant that there can be no Newton of the grass blade. So he separates those two out, but I think this was indeed the challenge that Darwin saw. He, Indeed, as he frequently remarked, he is the Newton of the grass blade. But he could do with natural law what others thought could not be done with natural law. So that's one, I think, small change. I mean, Yule was a progressivist. He thought that there was not exactly a genealogical evolution, but that creation began with simple creatures. The fossil record was so replete by that time, it seemed um, perfectly obvious that there had been a development of creatures, but he gave it a teleological construction. God kept replacing uh, creatures with more advanced ones to reach a certain end, namely us. It seems to me that Darwin took on that mantle. He took on that project to try to explain it. Now, your concept, you, you suggested that uh, Darwin used the language of purpose and so forth because, what, it was available to him, that was the way he could best explain things, but that's what, his, that's what science is. I can best explain it by using these concepts and by making this argument. That means that purpose is intrinsic to the theory that he is constructing and to the explanations he's constructing. So it's not dispensable. It is part of the whole theory. Uh, we can talk, perhaps, about uh, yeah. further problems. Well, mine is similar. I agree with your uh, account of morality 
uh, although we like to hear more about um, how he has a character of, uh, uh, well, I, I leave that out. Um, but um, I was concerned about your interpretation of the text because it is as if Darwin hadn't changed his mind at all, but I think the language, there is a clear change in language from the uh, uh, 1438 um, paper to, or notes, right, to the already the 1942 essay, it seems to me. Um, well, thanks for going there. In the, uh, in the 1938, says for which the world was brought into present state, which seems to indicate some cause, but later, is the highest good which we can conceive. And that is the same sort of explanation that he will give about anything that we might consider beautiful, striking, or anything like that that could be interpreted on the basis of the fact that you have many more individuals being born that can actually uh, survive. And so when he's talking about improvement or what is good for each being, it seems to me he's not talking about the good for each individual being. He's on, uh, it's about every type of being, actually what we call a lineage now. Well, uh, yes. first of all, I think uh, I try to be very careful in examining how Darwin uses the word being in the origin. And without exception, when he refers to beings or being, he's referring to an individual. So uh, there, I don't think there's any other way to interpret those passages. Even if you thought that he was referring to a species, species go out of existence. They <laughs> Uh, they're destroyed as well, so it doesn't really matter as far as that's concerned. So I think you're right about Darwin changing his views. And his, I mean, his theory is both about evolution and it is evolutionary. It, he develops ideas over time. But if a psychoanalyst put Darwin on the couch, he would declare him to be anal retentive because ideas that he formulated early on, he really never let go. He modifies them, he shapes them, he develops them. But they're retained. The, the Lamarckian notions, for example, are quite characteristic of that. So I wouldn't deny at all, in fact, I would insist upon it, that in the mid-1860s, this theological foundation for his theory uh, dissipates. Because by 1865, 1866, he's ready to say that the attitude that best captures my view about God is the term that uh, Huxley formulates, namely agnosticism. I don't know. So there is, I think, a continual transition in Darwin's attitudes about these matters. But the important point is that the theory that appears in 1859 is under the assumption that the laws governing it are designed laws and that there is a designer. Darwin, in the autobiography, says that when I finished the origin, I still believed in an intelligent cause governing the universe. He loses that belief, for sure, but the theory is structured under that Well, condition. I will argue more about that with other people, so maybe I'll catch you later. <coughs> well, we'll talk about it later, yeah. Um, Ed Mann, you're in Notre Dame. Um, this is a difficult line of thought, I think, because it seemed it's almost as if we're two people looking at a fairly complex poem, trying to decide what the dominant theme in the poem is. And um, you certainly make a strong argument for this teleological element being there in these early texts and being repeated throughout. My discomfort with your confidence in this has several roots. Um, one of them is that there's an early text in which Darwin says, if my theory be true, the whole fabric will totter and fall. And that clearly indicates that he's concerned about the the reception of his views by a scientific community which is very tightly bound together uh, with uh, an established religion uh, in, uh, in England. So that when in the essay of 1842, he talks about this 
selecting being. He's, you know, he, he says on the one hand, the this is a heuristic device. Somewhat I don't think he says that. I mean, he, it's a model. I completely agree with you. It is a model for natural selection. It's so, in that sense, heuristic. I agree. Yeah. Well, when I'm, I'm, I meant uh, pedagogically heuristic. That is. But he's writing this essay for himself, not for anyone else. He's explaining to himself what natural selection is all about. I mean, we have that notion that natural selection is like a light bulb being turned on. And that famous remark by Huxley that, you know, how stupid of me not to have thought of this first, but it took Huxley reading 490 pages to be convinced that it was a very simple idea. Well, he goes on to say about that, uh, that being explicitly that it's not an omniscient creator. And, uh, and it's right. almost as if he's using the metaphor uh, to, um, uh, to convince an audience uh, that's um, very sympathetic uh, to the power and uh, prominence of English agriculture, that his theory is in tune with uh, something that's essential to Britain's uh, preeminence in the world and its survival. Well, I, I take your point, Ed, I, and I think it's, a, it's an excellent point. I guess against that, I would say that if you look at the notebooks, where he is writing for himself, he's not writing for an audience, he's explaining things to himself, he uses this language. The language gets embedded in the theory. And you might think that already in 1842, he is thinking about an audience and how to convince an audience, but it looks like he's mostly formulating a model for himself. If he really did have a mechanistic model uh, for natural selection, you would think you would see it someplace. The, the language of mechanism is just absent altogether from the origin of species. It's not there. So that's the kind of uh, evidence I guess I would suggest against your view. And the further notion is if you ask, what is a theory? What is a scientific theory? Where is it? Is it in Darwin's head? Is it an abstract entity, as most philosophers think, that has different instantiations, but it's somehow in a platonic heaven? Or is it in the book? I mean, is it the, the language of the book? And I, my view is it's the language of the book. So that the language is indeed the theory. Now, if you ask Darwin later, and I think Darwin would be a bit on your side, if you ask him later, did you mean to say that natural selection is really like an, an anthropomorphic uh, structure or being making decisions, well, as you well know, uh, Wallace put that exactly to him and said, why don't you use survival of the fittest? It captures everything you need. Herbert Spencer's term is a lot better, and in the fifth edition, he, the chapter reads natural selection or the survival of the fittest. But he wouldn't get rid of natural selection. And I think if I had more time, and in fact, if you want to skip lunch, um, <laughs> maybe not, um, I would show you how this conception is woven into all the other parts. Uh, there are certain problems that Darwin can solve only under this assumption. So, but this is something to talk about at lunch. Bill Carroll from uh, Oxford. Uh, Professor Richards, uh, I wonder whether you might speculate uh, in, in your historical uh, habit uh, about the loss of discourse about teleology as evolutionary biology develops, especially under the neo-Darwinian synthesis. And to what extent do you think that the role of population statistics, or mathematics, and the whole, uh, that quantitative development, which does indeed uh, uh, abs at least abstract from or prescind from notion of purpose, plays a role in this sort of forgetfulness about uh, a Darwinian notion of evolution. I, I think you're perfectly right, and I think that movement, which really began in the last part of the 19th century, right through uh, the new synthesis, which I think that's when it became really quite dominant, uh, leads us to think. Um, there, there was a great uh, book in the history of science called The Edge of Objectivity by Charles Coulton Gillespie, 
And the edge of objectivity, anything that's going to be a science, Gillespie argued from the Greeks to the present, had to have a mathematical structure. So in some sense, it had to be quantitative. He got to Darwin. And he knew Darwin was a scientist. But it didn't look like Darwin did any mathematics. So that would have destroyed his thesis. So what Gillespie says is Darwin's theory is mathematical in spirit. And therefore, he's a scientist. But I think it is that notion that, yeah, it's mathematical in spirit, and it has been indeed mathematized, as you're suggesting. And there is a, there is a reading back of that, as it were, spirit into Darwin's accomplishment. And we see, we see Darwin in neo-Darwinian eyes. Needless to say, Darwin was not a neo-Darwinian. He was a 19th century thinker who used the, uh, the concepts that he had available in order to describe the phenomena that he wanted to describe and to explain. And those concepts, indeed, were things like teleological causality. So I think you're right. We, we, because of further developments, we tend to forget what the original structure was like. If I had time, I, I, would, have, I would have given you what, what is indeed the, the closing message. And I, I can see my, our moderator wants me to really make this the closing message, uh, which is that it's because Darwin had a concept of mind as the source and the structure of, of natural selection, that is, he understands selection as if it were a mind operating in nature, that we, from our perspective, can more easily assume that it's a mechanistic process. Because Darwin really didn't have models of mechanism that could accomplish what mind could accomplish. He just didn't have those models, so he wasn't likely to propose such a model as that which embodies natural selection. But because he could show the effectiveness of natural selection, uh, the moderns are more easily able to, to introduce those quantitative, mechanistic interpretations of it, but then assume that somehow that was what Darwin was doing himself. Phil Sloan, uh, first of all, Bob, I, you and I certainly agree on the exegesis of what Darwin himself is saying. But I wonder if you could comment on th this, the problem that I think is the more profound question about Darwin and ethics, and that is the kind of soil into which it falls. At the 1871, particularly taking the descent of man as an example, there is certainly ways in which one can proof text that work and take out a very, uh, in some ways, a very frightening view of human morality. And I'll, I'll be specific on one point. For instance, Darwin utilizes the moral sense theory, which has a long tradition. But the moral sense theory was based on a universality of human nature, so we would all react the same. Right. Once we get into a notion where we can speciate into different groups and races and so forth, it seems to me we certainly could get a very scary picture of what that natural morality could lead to. And of course, that's what gets picked up by Weikert and others. But so in other words, there's the historical text itself, and then there's the context in which it falls, which could certainly take from Darwin some very uh, different kind of conclusions than the ones in which you want to draw. I wonder if you could comment on that. I, I think you're absolutely right about that. And in, insofar as one emphasizes the ordinary interpretation of natural selection, as being red in tooth and claw, you're going to get a, a morality, a, a, one would think of a, a militaristic kind of morality that would be satisfactory to the Nazis. You know, the whole sort of linking of Darwinism to Nazism, I, why don't you link Christianity to Nazism? I mean, there's a great many more kinds of evidence that uh, Hitler was inspired and his group was inspired by certain kinds of interpretations of Christianity to fuel the kind of um, dogmatism and ultimately the Holocaust that he per perpetuates. And the linkage with Darwin is just, I, th I think, for the most part, it is an opportunistic move made by intelligent designers and creationists to try to discredit Darwinism altogether. Look what it leads to. But there is no question that what um, I think the vast numbers of the American public, and probably now the British public and other Europeans, are concerned about is that what, which Darwin was concerned about, namely morality. 
that if you, as I've heard this, and I'm sure you've heard some version of it, if you teach children that they came from monkeys, they're gonna act like monkeys. So that there is this fear, and I, you're perfectly right, there is this fear of this kind of interpretation. If you read The Descent of Man, you would get an entirely different view that natural selection um, has this, the deep structure of Darwin's moral theory is morality is bred in the bone and altruism is its source. It is acting for the good of another at cost to self, and I think most people intuitively think that's pretty much what the essence of morality is. Great. Thank you very much for your uh, paper. My name's Celia Dean Drummond from the University of Chester. Um, I've, I've um, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one has to do with with the way you're using history, as it were, to translate into concerns about the present. I'm not sure if you're familiar with John Dupre's recent critique in this area, but um, I, uh, one, of, one of his arguments is um, how far is it valid for us to go back to authors like Darwin and then assume that they are saying something interesting scientifically for today. In other words, what you seem to have done is taken what you found in, the, in your historical milling of what Darwin has said, which is itself um, a particular hermeneutic, and then say, well, this is, this is normative for us today. Um, I think that most scientists would say we need to actually look at what scienti scientists are saying about morality, about evolution, and that kind of thing, within the light of e um, evolutionary science as we know it now, rather than going back into history and mining, if you like, some of the scientific theories or other theories, which then are directly useful. In other words, you, you seem to have jumped to you know, 150, 200 years of history into the present. Um, so that's the first issue. The second one has to do with um, uh, some of the, uh, the remarks you make about morality itself and its evolvability or evolution. I myself, um, in, the, in the work that I have done, have come to the conclusion that morality cannot be hardwired into the genome in the way you're, um, uh, you seem to be hinting at, and maybe you didn't necessarily mean to say that. Uh, but, uh, but what I suggest is that other social animals, for example, have moral tendencies, social animals like primates, um, dogs, and that kind of thing, canids. From studying their behavior, it's clear that they have uh, leanings towards what might be called wild justice or some other um, forms of altruistic behavior. But to make the assumption that there is a sort of um, wiring directly into, uh, into our genetics, I think is, 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 is not really there in the evidence. In other words, the, there's no real evidence for a, a direct link between genes and behavior, a kind of sociobiology that you seem to have presupposed in your jump from Darwin to the present. Okay, well you have, you have two wonderful objections that now I have to pull these arrows out of my body in order to answer. I think um, your concern about using certain historical analyses to somehow justify a present theory is perfectly a good objection. But we do think that Darwin came up with some pretty good ideas that had, as it were, if you were in the theater, you would say it had legs. So the whole idea of the yeah. transmutation of species evolution, yeah. uh, if one looks at um, um, Darwin's expression of the emotion in men and animals. Yeah, he, he was also, if you look at his, his writing again, it was, it was it's quite obvious that he was ex extremely prejudiced in some of the ways he talked sure, about women. Sure, sure. This, this is not sort of... So in other words, we can't actually assume that he was right in absolutely... No, 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 no. I would not want to do that. Morality. First of all, the first part was a historical yeah. thesis. Okay. Let's find out what Darwin actually said. The second part, I tried to bolster in my minute and a half that I had left, uh, my view that this notion of morality has um, a, a foundation by pointing to empirical uh, experiments done today. So the work of Mark Hauser, I think, is, was for me quite illustrative. Your, your concern, I think, is that notions about universality when you're talking about genetic foundations for behavior is, is certainly an absolutely appropriate kind of concern. But we, but we do know that there are many different kinds of behavior that are universal. The only explanation seems to be a genetic explanation. So for example, the expression of the emotions, which again, Darwin pioneered. Here you have on the left a fellow who's actually got galvanized, but it is the expression of fear and terror 
Uh, Ibis Ibisfeld um, has conducted a lot of ethological studies. So here is a little girl who is opening a canister and out jumps a cloth snake and scares her. If you look at her face, she has a, a look of terror. It's the same look that this guy has. Here's an Anamana man, uh, man uh, who uh, Ibisfeld has now presented with a little box, and he opens it up, and a cloth mouse jumps out. And his expression, you can't see it too clearly here, is exactly the same as hers. Why is it that, um, and as I point back here, here is a blind girl, deaf and blind. When she's happy, her lips go up, as yours do and mine do. When she's sad, her lips go down, as yours and mine do, and virtually everyone does. Looks of surprise, joy, anger, fury. Um, these are recognizable signs across all nationalities, all groups. The only reasonable account, it seems to me, is that the, we either went through a bottleneck in which uh, these, these traits were in the repertoire, or um, well, that they were the ancestral traits. I don't know of a better one. Nobody has taught this little girl how to smile or how to frown. She knows how to do it, even though she's never experienced it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say one thing in response to that, in, in that I was at a, a, um, a conference on Darwin medicine and the humanities at Exeter um, quite recently, and there was a, a long paper discussing the expression of the emotions, um, and it's clear that the reception of that particular book and was very weak at the time. In other words, the scientific basis of what Darwin was saying in that book was, was very weak, and it hasn't really... But uh, Ibis, it Ibis hasn't, it hasn't work been substantiated. is quite recent. Yeah, it hasn't been substantiated. So in other words, I'm not, I, I I'm don't, not well, saying we'll that... Well, we'll have to disagree about that, because yeah. I think there's been tons of it. But we will do that at lunch. Okay. <laughs>